Hi, this is Ken Adams, and welcome to Valley View this week. And this week we're going to be talking about free parking in Salem, and the real cost, maybe. And co-hosting this week will be Abby Diaz, and our guest this week is Kurt Fisher, who's a bicycle pedestrian activist. And so, Kurt, what is the problem with free parking in downtown Salem? I describe it as a, as a, um, a financial issue that comes from many, many years of poor parking management downtown. It's the result of sort of an older paradigm regarding parking that regards it as a public good. You can never have too much of it. More is always better, and, and it's always beneficial, and there's no cost to it. But what we found in Salem is that there's a tremendous cost to all the free parking. And it's measured right now at about a million dollars a year that we're spending in urban renewal money um, to subsidize and support free parking downtown that would otherwise be available to spend on other downtown improvements. Sure. Bike ped safety, better bike lanes, better connectivity, um, beautifying the streetscape. There's a whole list of projects that I believe w that money would be better spent on than free well, parking. Yeah, and maybe it might be a, you know, I'm, I'm just throwing this out, it might be a better idea if they didn't have cars in downtown, except on the main streets where you need them, you know, and, and so then pedestrians wouldn't have to be dodging traffic necessarily. Well, I mean, would that be part of the, you know, something that would be... Pedestrian malls in downtown areas, the, the results are decidedly mixed. Okay. <laughs> um, so I went to school in Kalamazoo, Michigan, actually, which was the first pedestrian mall ever created in the United States. Oh, wow. And um, they, when I was in college there, there was a movement to restore traffic to that street. Okay. Um, so that one wasn't very successful. Um, but other places it has been. I lived in I lived in Vermont and in Burlington, Vermont. They have a very successful one. I lived in Boulder, Colorado, and they have a very successful one there too. So, yeah. and I've been to the one in Santa Monica, and that one seems to be pretty successful. Mm -hmm. And I think they call it the Promenade or something. And they, mm -hmm. you know, and it's it's gone kind of upscale since people yeah. can easily walk in that area. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. But it, it there's needs... a lot of things we can do to to improve the experience for pedestrians downtown without you know going without banning cars entirely. Right. Yeah. But w one of the things that attracted me to the Salem area was having a downtown that was a downtown, and you know because I've lived in a lot of towns, um, especially in the San Francisco Bay Area, where the downtowns have been basically decrepit and, and just falling apart because everybody was going out to the malls. And mm -hmm. and like that was one thing I was trying to get away from. I wanted to see a real downtown. I didn't want to go down mm -hmm. Lancaster Boulevard. I still don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to see that being the option. Mm -hmm. So so what is the answer on that? I mean, because if there's no free parking, are people going to stop coming into downtown? Well, the val the the um it's a different product that you're consuming in a downtown environment versus a mall environment. Um, I believe that the people that the, what draws people to a downtown is the quality of the experience while you're there, the quality of the built environment. Um, you've got a uh, an urban um, landscape that's intact, that's not broken up by a lot of surface parking lots. You know, you've got continuous storefronts. The storefronts are up on the street. Um, versus a more suburban environment where you've got lots of surface parking lots. Um, you don't have uh, continuous storefronts that make it pleasurable to walk. Um, and I think if you, for a lot of people that are very passionate about downtown, and that's the reason that people are so concerned about free parking is because they're very passionate about downtown. Yeah. Um, but I think when you, I think if you examine the reasons why people um, are, are are so concerned about downtown, it's because of what free parking has done to places like Lancaster Drive, like Commercial Street. Because what you see there is vast quantities of free parking. Parking, right. parking upon parking upon parking. Mm -hmm. And it degrades the quality of the experience for the shopper that's there. The aesthetics. Right. Um, and it's not free. 
by any stretch because the developer has to pay to, to build that parking. Uh, they might have to pay security, lighting, um, stormwater treatment. There's a lot of costs that are buried in um, the cost of goods and services that you buy in those malls that aren't passed on, that you don't see directly when you go and park in those places, but are, 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 are bundled into the price of the, of the products that you buy there. So, also, I, I guess, you know, something that occurred to me is, is that one of the problems, I think, too, is that the transportation system is all geared toward private cars. Mm -hmm. And maybe some of that development money could be spent on developing better public transportation, at least the, they could have it on the weekends, for example. <laughs> or, you know, one of the things that I'm always amazed at, and it's, it's happened most of the cities I lived at because I, I worked off shifts, is quite often you can't get to and from get to or from work if you work an off shift because the public transportation right. stops. Yeah. And so that that is something that I've seen constantly. Well, for instance, in in Boulder, Colorado, uh, I mentioned that before, they actually um, uh, use the revenue generated from downtown parking to actually fund eco passes for all downtown employees so that they can use public transportation and they don't have to bring their, their cars downtown. And tie up parking um, places. That's a great incentive. So Atlanta is debating a, a tax on parking spaces to fund transit right now. Um, Vancouver, British Columbia is, use, is going to use parking revenue to fund their bike share. Um, oh, expansion great. of their bike share program. So there's a lot of um, really good positive uses for parking revenue. Mm -hmm. um, because of the relationship with chariots and the city, I don't think that's yeah. possible here. But one thing that is that is on the table, that is in the uh, project that's in the queue of urban renewal projects is a downtown circulator trolley. Uh, oh, okay. A rubber tire trolley that would connect the the close-in neighborhoods with the downtown. Right. Well, that so would that's be good. one thing that yeah. they can do, and they can and it can be a private company. It doesn't have to be a chariot's um, service, um, but that's something that they can do. That's possible to do. So right now, there's there's people out collecting signatures to keep free parking, mm -hmm. and um, so I, I would imagine that's probably going to get on the ballot. And there will be. That's what's being reported now. Yeah, which we can and, and, it on about. and so, like, it is important for people to realize what what you're talking about is is the cost of you know having this free parking downtown. But um, I, I just I guess my concern is I don't want to see the downtown degraded as a result of the free parking, but I also don't want it downgraded because of. Um, people have to pay for parking and then right. going over to the mall instead. So it, so how, is that, how do you think that's going to play out? Um, I would expect the petition to pass. You would. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, free parking is like promising a chicken in every pot. Everybody loves free parking. And, um, you know, from all that I've heard from the petitioners, um, they're, they're really not laying out the, the cost. You know, mm -hmm. they're not laying the choices on the table. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of people that have signed the petition don't know, are really aware of what the trade-offs are. What the or real what, cost is. What the real cost is or what we've sacrificed over the years to have free parking. Because it's been, you know, over the last 10 years, we're set to spend, with the most recent budget, we're going to spend over $9 million dollars on free parking downtown, on, on free parking, right. down, what I call the illusion of free parking downtown. So we pay for it in taxes and instead. So, uh, in urban renewal taxes, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, yeah. and you know, for those of us that do live close and do value walking and biking, we, we pay for the parking whether we use it or not. Well, not only that, but there's the safety issue because you've had so many people driving into downtown using their vehicles. It, it sometimes is dangerous riding your bike or walking around through the midtown downtown areas, and you know living downtown, I see that. Right. The, and and what you're talking about there, I think, is the is the phenomenon of cruising for free parking. <laughs> <laughs> um, people who when when you don't have a well managed, well regulated parking supply. 
um, parking it can be hard to come by. Right. So you have to drive um, far out of the way to um, find a parking space. Um, this was famously uh, satirized in Seinfeld <laughs> um, when you know George Costanza famously quoted, "You know, I never park in a garage. I never pay for parking. I can't do it. It's like going to a prostitute. <laughs> Why should I apply myself when I can get it for free?" And yeah. then you you cruise out of direction, and when you when you do that, you come into conflict with all kinds of other road users, mm -hmm. uh, pedestrians, transit users, and and that person is a distracted driver by definition right. because they're or they're, agitated. they're looking for the parking spot. Yeah. They're not paying attention to well, other yeah, people that are walking. because they're they're watching the parking places instead of the pedestrian crossing in front of them. And I've right. seen that downtown. Yeah. That um, you know, like one the, I, I remember this real clearly. The first car stopped, and the car behind him tried to cut, and there cut was a yeah. 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 yeah, and there was a pedestrian right there. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and it's even worse in our downtown because we have the one-way street. Grid yeah, well, that that's demand, exactly what that, it, what that demands you to travel even further out of the way than you would ordinarily have to um, sure. if we could go two ways on the streets. <laughs> so, so the city council proposed or having parking meters. I mean, or it's been up for discussion. Uh, right. The, t the, the parking task force um, issued a recommendation, and part of that recommendation was to incrementally transition toward a paid parking system downtown. Interesting. And would it be the same fees, or would they go up, or would they go down? You know, like currently it's like... Right. Right now, it's whatever council formulates. I mean, they the recommendation, the staff report that came to council was very open-ended. Um, there weren't, a, it, it didn't set a particular rate. It didn't say where the meters would exactly go. It didn't, it didn't specify a strategy for, you know, installing them or anything like that. It was very open-ended. Mm -hmm. And there have been plenty of time, you know, and there, there are a lot of the concerns of the petitioners can be addressed with a well-constructed parking plan. And I certainly wish there was some way that we could <laughs> get the two together to, to really talk about their differences, you know. Yeah. Well, sure. one of the things, I, I read your article, and it was talking about the fact that it, in Salem, like 90% of the parking places are usually occupied. In it, in a there's a there's a core retail there's a core area downtown and it's about 789 spaces or about 68% of the supply downtown where utilization is over 90%. And that means that that usually when you come downtown in that area um, it's rare that you find an open space. So now you got to go so around the block. Yeah, and, that's and when you need to cruise to the other areas, that to the other underpark areas. And now Whereas, you got to walk. Right. Whereas if we had a a you know a well managed parking supply, you would come down Liberty Street, for instance, and you would see one or two spaces open on every single block. So you would be immediately be able to pull your car in to an open space. Um, it, right in front of the store, where you, wherever you want to shop, get out of your car faster, get in the store faster, get shopping, yeah. and actually, in um, you know, you mentioned the competition between the the suburban malls right. and the downtown. Well, one of the one of the most famous stories about about parking meters is Old Pasadena, California. So back in the early '90s, they put parking meters in. And um, what happened was they used the revenue to improve the town, sort of like we have on the, the opportunity to do right now. Um, and actually, the retail sales went up. up. Really? And over yeah. several decades, their downtown outperformed the suburban malls by a wide margin. Uh, Ventura, California, during the recession, um, installed parking meters, and retail sales went up 3%. Really? Um, there was a, a, a story published by the Sightline Institute, the environmental think tank out of Seattle, 
um, when they extended meter, metering in Chinatown, the businesses said, oh, oh you know, since they, since they extended the metering hours, uh, you know, business has fallen off by 50 percent. It's been a disaster. Mm -hmm. But when Sightline went and looked at the receipts, they found out that actually the retail sales went up 5 percent, and it out and their sales outperformed other areas of town. Um, and it's yeah. because and there's a lot of there's a lot of theories. Right. Sure. Um, availability is one, mm -hmm. but the other thing is you know. Who's going to be the customer that's going to order another bottle of wine, order dessert, leave a better tip? You know, is it the person that is that is fine with paying for parking or paying to have the parking available, or is it the person who you know cruises for free parking? <laughs> the George Costanzas of the, the world. The George Costanzas, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's also interesting too because like. Um, you know, like when you're shopping for gifts, say at Christmas time, you know, like if you go to the mall and buy something, and now you're mailing it to somebody in a different part of the country, well, they could probably go to the local mall and get that same thing. But if you go into like our downtown or a lot of downtowns, you're going to find unique things, mm -hmm. things that you're not going to find at the mall. Yeah. And so you don't have to worry about getting something for Cousin Tim because he's not going to find that anyplace else. You know, mm -hmm. and and so I think that is kind of a valuable thing that like a lot of people lose sight of. That and, and going downtown and shop, the experience of shopping in a historic district like ours is a unique experience. That's why I don't think that that it's the same experience as a Kaiser Station or a Lancaster right. Mall. Yeah. So that's why I don't think you can immediately assume that that shopper who values that experience. Is just going to go to Kaiser Station because it's a because it's a different experience. It's a different type of shop, yeah. Um, yeah. and it's and and it's the experience of you know experiencing the historic buildings and the historic district and those Absolutely. sorts of things. Yeah, and in our region, in our region, I think it's the only place in our region where you can get that experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I would have to agree with you, and I know that my son came to visit shortly after we moved here. And he was living in Los Angeles at the time, and he loved it downtown because we were mm -hmm. able to walk downtown. We were able to kind of walk around, find different things, and plus mm -hmm. it was had lights, and it was just you know it was a nice environment, mm -hmm. you know, and it seemed friendly, you yeah. know, and and like some of these malls, you know, late at night they're not friendly when you go out in the far reaches of the parking lot. Sure. I mean, no. <laughs> so, they're kind of spooky, in fact. <laughs> so, so I mean, that's you're you're hitting on things that I think a lot of people though don't really look at, and and like you you mentioned that like it, this initiative, if it goes through, would probably pass. So the thing is, is the is there going to be any kind of campaign for uh, explaining to folks what that free parking is really costing them? Um, or is it just well, up to you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's pretty much just up to me, <laughs> and I'm trying to do my and I'm, and I'm trying to do my part, and I'm trying to change the conversation. Um, uh, but it's uh, you know it's difficult because it's something sure. that that you know people assume it's axiomatic, as some mm -hmm. as a one commentator put it recently. Yeah. So, I mean, have you been down to like a city council meeting? Have they? And has there been a I haven't been on there on this topic, but I've been there on many topics before. <laughs> and, and well, do they seem open to listening to this argument or this discussion? Oh, of course. They, I, I, you know, I think one one thing that opened. I was skeptical about the parking meter proposal in the beginning too. Okay. Um, because I had um, I had listened to a lot of the arguments made by the Salem Downtown Partnership. Um, their story has been a long time for a long time that we don't have enough people parking downtown to justify meters. Um, that we have plenty of parking, therefore we don't need meters. That's always been their story. And before I and and it wasn't until that I actually looked at the actual studies and saw what the utilization rates actually were that I that I thought it was important to speak out. Um, and I was really impressed when um, 
when I watch the um, Councilor Bennett and our mayor and our city manager sit down before the state's majority editorial board and lay everything out for them, and that's when I was I was really impressed with the work that they did, mm -hmm. and um, so I really knew that they were doing something because it was the right thing to do. It's not right. politically popular for them to do. Right. Um, and I think it's just a matter of, of whether or not they can get downtown businesses down to the table so they can craft a plan that you know, meets all their some serious concerns. Sure. Sure. So is there a way for like, people watching this show to you know, maybe get better informed or to maybe lobby some of these businesses for um, you know, more experience? non-free parking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or, I mean, is there, what would you suggest to people that would like to see what you're advocating for? What, what could they do? Um, they can certainly contact their counselors. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, they can go, they can Google Park, Salem Parking Task Force and, and look mm -hmm. at the documents there. They can be hard, they can be difficult to they decipher. can be difficult to decipher. <laughs> um, have a conversation with their counselor. I think you know. I think Chuck. Ben, I think Councilor Bennett's been great on this issue. Yeah. Uh, City Manager Norris, the mayor, has been. Um, just have conversations with those people that have you know that have done the research and understand what the trade-offs are and listen to you know what their goals are for downtown because they really are, this really is an initiative to to improve downtown because right. this is uh, you know it's a financial drain on downtown and it's a financial barrier that's that's keeping us from doing a lot of good things to improve the downtown yeah, one of the things too that I noticed too about like Lancaster and streets like that and other towns is that um, they seem to be extremely hard hit in recession. So Absolutely. you'll see a lot of vacancies mm -hmm. in those places, and now you've got all this parking and vacancies. And to me, it's not. I've always thought that that is um, a very poor use of of land. Oh, it absolutely sure. is, and it's um, and that's why in under our land use system in our comprehensive plan, um, we have goals to reduce the per capita parking supply um, by 2015, uh, and it's because there's a tremendous social cost to having too much parking. It incentivizes car use. Mm -hmm. It's an indirect subsidy for consuming oil and pollution and congestion and crashes. Yeah. Um, it's not a it's not a public good as a lot of people right. like to think it is. It's a private benefit that has a tremendous social cost. Mm -hmm. And I if you look at there was costs. a you know um, University of Pennsylvania did a study, um, not a definitive study, but they looked at they looked at more than a dozen cities and looked at their parking policies, mm -hmm. and they found that. The cities that increase their parking supplies versus the cities that manage their parking supplies, the ones that manage their parking supplies with free parking or with, with paid parking, uh, they produce more jobs, they have higher income levels, and they have lower rates of driving. Yeah, yeah. And they have better transit service. Yeah. So there's all these, there's all these positive effects of a well-managed parking supply. There's, you know, there's this faint, there, um, there's this picture going around now of, of, of Detroit, <laughs> um, and it's an aerial view of Detroit that highlights all the surface parking lots, and about 40 percent of downtown Detroit now has been converted to surface parking. And they're even considered, and, and they, they were recently debating knocking down another historic building and replacing it with a surface parking lot, too. Oh, my gosh. So, Wait a minute. This is Detroit, a city that's been hard hit and has acres and acres of homes that have been uh, foreclosed on and are empty or boarded mm -hmm. up and been firebombed and everything else. And now they're talking about putting more parking in. Who's going to go there? <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly right. And when you, whenever you, whenever you dedicate a, a, you know, a piece of land to parking, there's a tremendous opportunity cost because that's a piece of land that's not available, that's not available for a store, not available for an office, not available for a home. Right. 
um, you know, that, that are higher value land uses than parking and produce more revenue in, in sure. terms of taxes back to the city. I mean, and imagine what, in just imagine how much more um, active our downtown would be if you looked at those parking garages <laughs> and imagine those as, um, you know, mixed-use development, sort of like yeah. this building that we're in right now. And we had actually oh, people living downtown. Yeah, yeah, that was one of the things. I used to live in Sacramento, and they were always talking about that because 5 o'clock came, you basically rolled up the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. There was nobody really living downtown. Yeah. And once the legislatures left, bam, it was like deserted city down there. Yeah. And and that's what I, I don't see here. There, there's people walking around doing things in downtown Salem. And you're right. That, that to me, is like something that is important for us to kind of keep a hold of. That's and when you're, when you're talking about those corridors like Lancaster and commercial, too, the parking that you see there isn't because the developer necessarily wants it there. It's there because the code prescribes it to be there, because, because yeah. they're required to provide a certain number of parking spaces per land use right. um, for the square footage. Um, and uh, one of the one of the mo one of the most visionary things that Portland did back um, um, back when the Mount Hood Highway died, yeah, was they abolished parking minimums in transit corridors. So they basically said you can do you don't have to provide a certain number of parking spaces in these transit corridors. And when you go to Portland and you see the effect of uh, the building patterns mm -hmm. where you have more of those buildings up on the street yeah. it makes it much more walkable much more pleasant to be there and much more attractive to use transit well yeah, yeah and transit needs um, compact populations right to make it efficient and you and need walkability because right. ever, because you know we're we're all pedestrians at one point or another. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> yeah. no, even if we do drive. Right. But transit users are more, a bigger portion of the trip is pedestrian. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Kurt, for coming in and talking about free parking in Salem. And yeah. uh, thank you, Gabby, for joining me. Of course. And welcome back to Valley View next week. And we'll be on some other topic. But thank you for watching. Thank you.